Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar titled Green Shore, uh, Impact, Value, and Lessons Learned Using a Triple Bottom Line Evaluation. Uh, my name is John Somerville, and I will be the moderator for today's webinar. I'm a policy analyst at Natural Resources Canada. Uh, most of you are listening to the webinar directly uh, through your computer speakers. However, if you run into any audio issues, you can call into the teleconference line. You can find the teleconference number and the participant code in the top left corner under message from the host or in the webinar reminder email sent earlier today. Um, for those of you who do dial into the teleconference line, your lines will be automatically muted uh, to avoid any audio distractions or feedback during the webinar. Um, there will be a dedicated Q&A session for today's webinar. Uh, but that does not mean you have to hold your questions until then. Uh, please feel free to type your questions during the presentation in the chat box area on your left, and those will be answered by our presenters um, at the end of the webinar. Uh, we are recording today's webinar, and we'll be sending a link to everyone who has registered. Uh, if you do run into any audio or technical issues during the webinar, please hold, uh, hover your mouse over Suzanne Sealing's name in the attendee list under host and click on start private chat. Uh, today's webinar is brought to you by Canada's Climate Change Adaptation Platform and their Coastal Management Working Group. Uh, the Coastal Management Working Group consists of representatives from federal, provincial, and territorial governments, academia, as well as professional and other organizations working against adaptation and increased resilience to climate change along Canada's coast. Uh, the Coastal Management Working Group is co-chaired by Natural Resources Canada and the Government of Prince Edward Island. The project being presented today was funded with support from Natural Resources Canada's Climate Change Adaptation Program under a call for proposals related to alternative and innovative options to hard protection infrastructure solutions. So now I'd like to introduce our speakers for today's uh, webinar. Uh, Amanda Aguirre, the International Team Director and Business Lead for Climate Change Adaptation at ESSA Technologies. She operates at the nexus of climate change adaptation, disaster resilience, and sustainable development, and is passionate about equipping individuals and organizations to understand climate-related risks um, so they can move more readily, incorporate into planning, and decisions that affect environmental, social, and economic outcomes. She has a breadth of Canadian and international experience in adaptation and climate resilience, uh, including in program design, policy analysis, vulnerability and risk assessment, knowledge synthesis, and monitoring and evaluation. Uh, Richard Boyd is Director of Research at All One Sky Foundation, a not-for-profit charitable organization that assists communities at the next system in climate change, an environmental economist, research interests include climate risk assessment and economic decision-making methodology, and he has authored several resources, guides, and other topics. Over the last 25 years, he has led numerous assessments of the social economic impact of climate change on water resources and quality, human health, energy systems, and the built environment as well as the costs and benefits of adaptation actions to inform decision-making at all levels of government, uh, both within Canada and internationally. As the Executive Director of the Stewardship um, Centre for BC, E.G. Blair provides leadership and project management for delivery of stewardship projects and resources to audiences throughout BC, uh, with deep experience in science-based best management practices for land and water, CG has been instrumental in the development, application, and proliferation of Greenshore's program. It's an incentive-based credit and rating system for minimizing the impacts of new shoreline development, as well as restoring the shoreline ecosystem function of previously developed sites. She has co-authored numerous publications on Greenshore's, uh, delivers Greenshore's Level 1 and Level 2 training to communities in BC, uh, is a member of Natural Resources Canada's Coastal Management Working Group, manages the BC Green Shores Local Government Working Group and provides overall technical expertise and project management 
for green shores in Canada, um, coast to coast to coast. Um, so now we'd like to see um, who's on the line with us today and conduct a quick survey of who is in the audience. So please uh, pull up the poll here and we'll get a uh, quick result. That's excellent. So it looks like we have a good spread uh, between government and nonprofit and academia and industry and consultants as well. Um, so without further delay, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Amanda, Richard, and DG for presenting the webinar today, and we'll, we'll turn it over.
over to DG. Yes, you see, I'm great, Richard. Talk. Thanks, DG.
Uh, hi, yes. and thanks, DG. Um, I just want to confirm that you can hear me to start with, because um, uh, I know there was a bit of a problem earlier. Okay, yeah, sorry, thanks. I just wanted to confirm that. Yeah, um, I just wanted to briefly um, uh, highlight some of the objectives of the uh, triple bottom line evaluation that, um, that we performed for the Green Shore site. Um, the sort of overarching objective was to express the value of the Green Shore's approach to shoreline development and restorations in, in dollar terms as, as far as possible. Um, and in doing so, we wanted to adopt a, a sort of societal or triple bottom line perspective, um, reflecting the nature of the benefits that were being generated um, by the, the Green Shores practices. And um, it, it, as DG was saying there, like we, we wanted to develop an approach that was um, scalable and, uh, and also um, practical so that it could be applied um, to other uh, development sites um, moving forward. Um, and then also to develop um, in support of that, to develop a sort of spreadsheet tool that could be um, used to inform the analysis at other, other sites. Um, as I was saying, we, were, we adopted a triple bottom line or, or um, three P's accounting um, framework for the analysis as we wanted to, um, to de determine whether Green Shores practices made economic sense. But we wanted to do that from a sort of societal perspective, looking at the benefits that um, accrue to the wider society and not just solely the investor, and also capturing impacts upon um, ecological health and, and the environment. Um, and as I sort of alluded to there, most of the benefits from um, uh, Green Shores development practices will manifest themselves as improvements in the provision of uh, ecosystem services. So um, in terms of the benefit evaluation, we adopted this sort of an ecosystem services based approach and specifically um, uh, worked with the economics of ecosystems and biodiversities framework which um, distinguishes between four broad groups um, of ecosystem services shown in, in the slide there. Um, provisioning, regulating, ser regulatory services, cultural services, and supporting and habitat services. And, and in terms of what we were able to capture um, within the benefit assessment, um, the, the, the uh, individual ecosystem services that are marked by an asterisk were captured within the analysis. Um, given the nature of the sites and information that was available um, to us, we didn't look at provisioning services, but didn't really feel that that was a, a, an omission. Um, like a, a recent um, study by the David Suzuki Foundation of ecosystem services from coastal areas in the BC Lower Mainland, um, you know, we would be basically capturing about 90% of the benefits estimated by that study by focusing in on um, the, the, the asterisk marked um, services there in the slide. Um, many of the, like you probably surmised there from looking at the slide, many of those, of those um, ecosystem services are what we call a non-market um, services. They, they're, they, they don't have a, a readily observable market price that we can use for um, valuation of the benefit. Um, and in economics, there are, there are a range of different um, specialist valuation tools um, that could be used to value each of those individual ecosystem services. But those, those tools are um, time consuming and very, um, quite expensive to implement. Um, and given the uh, number of services that we're trying to capture within the assessment, it just, it just wasn't practical within this study um, to do these sort of primary um, studies. And so we had um, basically used uh, an approach called benefit transfer um, uh, and uh, adapted that um, uh, so that it was as, as practical as possible to implement within the, within the study. And it, the, the benefit transfer approach we adopted essentially um, uh, you know, in, was, uh, comprises of three steps. The first one is sort of collating the sort of um, relevant valuation information, which is done through um, a literature review, um, looking at uh, you know uh, different studies in 
um, countries with comparable um, socioeconomic and then land use patterns to, to, to the BC Lower Mainland. Um, and then developing a sort of um, database that, that to hold evaluation information that we were able to um, obtain so that we could um, process it and uh, filter it um, as necessary um, for the benefit assessment. Um, and like the studies that we were looking at weren't just restricted to, to, the, to BC or, or Canada. We were looking at studies also from the US and Northern Europe. Um, and, and them also from, from New Zealand as well. And so you need to um, make adjustments um, that, um, uh, for differences in currency, differences in the timing of the studies relative to the base year we adopted for our analysis, which was 2018. And then transfer those values from the original studies in, in those different um, countries uh, so that they could be expressed in 2018 Canadian dollars. And, and there's, there's methods out there, best practice methods for doing that, and we adopted those within the study. Um, and also, uh, it's necessary, as like for the cultural services and the habitat services, we expressed all the values in, in terms of um, uh, dollars per person per year, um, which means that when we're aggregating up over the benefits, we need to also know the population over which we're aggregating those, um, those service benefits. And so that's the sort of processing step of the evaluation information. And then the, the sort of final step involved building, um, like I, I referred to earlier, a, a spreadsheet tool that would enable us to um, uh, you know, process the information and generate um, uh, measures of aggregate benefit across the different ecosystem services and for the specific case study sites that we looked at. Um, just want to highlight some um, aspects of the the, the, the methodology. Um, uh, one thing that we found is that there was sufficient information for habitat services and for cultural services in terms of the number of observations that we could find um, that we could transfer uh, the, you know, to the case study site. And the, the information allowed us, um, or like the, the quantity of information and quality of information allowed us to separate the values out into um, those that might be relevant to small all improvements um, at the uh, de uh, at the green shore sites um, through to moderate and large improvements in the provision of habitat services uh, and also ecosystem services. So we had three different sets of unit values that we could apply. Um, and as part of uh, the application process, then we then also needed to somehow come up with a mechanism to establish three, like to quantify three different levels of improvement at the site. And to do that for habitat services, for example, um, we uh, worked with the uh, accreditation system that um, DG referred to earlier. Um, and there's a range of different um, uh, credits that are awarded for um, different characteristics um, of the development site. And the ones um, there on the left, the credits with the asterisks, were the credit scores that we used to inform our uh, determination of the um, habitat evaluations as to whether they related to small, medium, or large improvements. And so, for example, if you look at the the, uh, the credit number five there, um, you know, the, you know, depending um, uh, the site could receive up to about ten points depending on the extent of the sort of foreshore, backshore enhancements, the direct lagoon or marsh habitat enhancements, and whether or not there was a creation of a critical or sensitive habitat. So depending on um, the, the uh, credit scores that were awarded to different sites, we were able to come up with a total score um, with respect to habitat services that we could then use to establish whether the improvement at the site was small, medium, and large, and therefore what the applicable valuation was. And similar um, sort of points award skills were also developed for cultural services um, and uh, disturbance regulation. I like part of the regulatory services. Another um, aspect of the approach that we used um, was that uh, in the literature, uh, there, there's also observations that the, the values that we attach to um, different levels of improvement in the provision of ecosystem services actually decline with the distance um, that we are from the site. 
And so we were able to use um, information from the literature to um, build these sort of distance decay functions so that the unit values that applied to small, moderate, or large improvement at one of the sites, we could work out how those values declined as the distance from the site increased. And then that allowed us to establish, um, uh, uh, yeah, then we could look at um, the, the population that fell within different distance bands from the site and then um, assign an appropriate unit value to those populations. And, and these observations from the literature are based on the fact that the further you are away from a site, the more difficult it is to sort of access that site. And also there, there will be more than um, one uh, or more substitute sites that you could actually um, uh, participate or go to um, instead of the, the sort of case study site. And those things dilute the value that we attach um, you know, to the case study site. And, you know, as part of the um, process for trying to aggregate the, the values up um, for the individual sites for habitat and cultural services, um, it was necessary to then um, create these uh, population concentric zones around the site um, and then establish the population within each um, of these zones. And we, and we just used a one kilometer interval because um, uh, that was reflected in the, uh, in the distance decay function. Um, and mentioned before, at the outset, we um, uh, developed a sort of spreadsheet tool um, to, to try and um, do, well, to, to do the calculations for us, but also that would allow um, uh, the expansion of the, the, of the uh, triple bottom line evaluation to other sites um, in the future. And just Thanks, want to highlight Richard. some aspects um, of the, the Now, tool generating that information um, and a tool to demonstrate the economic the value of applying Greenshore's the, practices the, the was one objective of, site, of our work. Which is really um, as the, DG um, mentioned at the beginning, uh, another objective the, the was to identify promising strategies and actions to enhance of, um, the uptake habitat. of Greenshore's in BC um, and beyond. And those um, when we first like started the, out the, the project, DG was most interested in understanding what was working, what wasn't working with Greenshore's in BC, of, um, as well as what could expanding Greenshore's programming um, to Atlantic the, the Canada sort of look like. So these priorities the inform your work. Regulatory services and also the, um, uh, the this slide regulatory just summarizes well. the approach we so took for each of those questions and the outputs that we, um, within, um, we achieved as a result. So a review of program documentation, focus groups, dis focus group discussions with local um, governments and members like of the Greenshore's um, technical um, advisory committee, that, as well as um, interviews with funders and elected and officials, informed our analysis um, of implementation um, challenges uh, for Greenshore's like, BC, dollars as well as opportunities to address them. Um, to These our, activities our also inform the development of a conceptual model linking activities um, by the Stewardship from, from Center for BC so to results on the ground on BC coast um, a, a little benefit. bit, as well as recommendations on possible improvements for Greenshore's so that, programming that, that's in another sort of, um, key Now for we, we, Atlantic we Canada, or the Maritimes really, we took a little di different approach to understand like that, how to scale it, earlier with respect leveraging to planned services, events and existing local networks. We were able to feed seeding questions into a workshop convened um, the, the, in New Brunswick in October 2019 with participants from New Brunswick, um, Nova so Scotia, and Prince Edward Island. We also deployed an online survey targeting waterfront property Owners, i.e., homeowners, which and shoreline professionals in those in, four in province, three case. provinces. And again, we developed and a, we relied, a sort we were, of qualitative um, scoring system. Very fortunate based on, to be able to rely um, on a group of representatives from the PEI gov um, government, by, um, Ecology um, Action Center, New Brunswick and Environmental Network, and Dalhousie University uh, to and distribute, then, um, for distribute the survey link the, to their the networks. We're really, really grateful for this, otherwise, we would um, have very little to show um, for. And I think like some of you have um, are in attendance the habitat and wind exposure, or to maybe hearing from you later on as well. So the dwelling density around the around the site. And that would generate an overall measure of um, So the table on this slide summarizes um, at a which, high level um, what we heard from three stakeholder groups in BC on current implementation, implementation challenges and opportunities to enhance uptake of Greenshore practices.
And then As you can see there on the left hand or sort of the middle column, all three groups note challenges tasks, relate, related to um, finance yeah, and, and financial incentives, the including um, the perception that it's expensive to implement um, green shores as a remediation approach, and with homeowners and smaller the, communities um, in particular expressing a need um, for access to additional of, uh, funding. The fact that green shores brings benefits beyond those accrued by owners or operators of coastal property, as Richard has demonstrated. In, in the economic and analysis, provide, um, <laughs> creates expectations that others should subsidize education and implementation. Benefit, and the arguably, the public good nature of applying well Green Shores techniques provides grounds for offering financial support or recognizing this investment as private investment in government fiscal frameworks. Um, so now I just want to for example, talk through about, tax reductions um, as a like percentage we, of we property value. The, uh, the tool to three um, Aside from sites, sort of financial um, challenges, sort of uh, there's the, also a limited um, history of implementation success, which can shape people's confidence in green shores um, techniques as effective program with coastal protection, for example. Sites, and um, part of this is the reality that coastlines um, are complex, um, dynamic, area. and part of larger systems. So it can be challenging to pinpoint the problems that um, green shores can help address. The, um, also, uh, once like implemented, net, um, as uh, one of the stakeholders conveyed, king tides, for example, can rearrange the configuration of natural shoreline the, um, features, so changes attributable to green shores can be hard to detect. And benefits are shown, Another um, challenge highlighted by funders in, the in particular is the use there. of inconsistent um, terminology. Is that, um, uh, living shorelines, natural uh, shorelines, uh, green infrastructure, uh, nature-based um, solutions, natural assets, these, these are all terms that are tossed around, in the, the sometimes in interchangeably, which can program. pose problems or inefficiencies in establishing partnerships or identifying or securing funding. And I think this is a well, had a, a topic positive, that's um, being addressed um, currently, uh, like benefit, um, maybe through the Canadian and Council and of Ministers of the Environment. For every dollar in terms of opportunities um, to enhance uptake of green shores in um, BC, and also, uh, opportunities include the, um, mainstreaming and, green shores and, and concepts into policies and planning instruments, as, BC, as, as we, um, DG has explained in her intro slides. The, um, and uh, as she noted, some local governments um, have already included provisions around hardening in official community plans and have declared green shores as a preferred way of dealing that, with foreshore um, allocations. With the, the BC At the same time, though, changes in rules and norms need to be paired um, with resources to support compliance. Tool. So, for and example, introduce, the, introducing um, language about not interrupting future, coastal processes um, as a condition uh, for uh, permitting means that homeowners need to know what natural processes program. are supposed to be present. And again, the, so the, there's a role the, um, for governments there to undertake broad-based baseline assessment works so users can gain access to high-quality information. Other opportunities mentioned include increased awareness of worsening coastal hazards in a changing climate and related interest in nature-based approaches to climate resilience in Canada. Um, and these are trends to see on, as is the growing network of contractors and, and trained in green shores practices, visible examples of green shores in practice, and such as that, the three just, examples that, uh, like that Richard there, highlighted. The, um, the, main, the um, importance of contractors of as amplifiers uh, cannot be overstated, in, in, in as uh, the, one of the one of the, the interview, one of the folks that I interviewed and mentioned, now I will most of the green shores for home certifications that exist on mid-Vancouver Island are attributable to a single contractor who has taken the level two, the advanced level Green Shores course, and is a is an advocate for Green Shores approaches. And I think he might be on the call as well, um, I believe. So through our research, we were able to outline our hypothesis about the impact of Green Shores programming in BC. And what's, what I'm showing on this slide here is the missing middle between the activities related to green shores that DG introduced at the beginning of the presentation and ultimate results on the ground, which are really uh, what we're hoping for and are visualized at the, on the right side of the slide. And so what we've, what we've been able to learn from, um, from the interviews and focus group discussions and from documentation reviews is that by building awareness of Green Shores approaches and their benefits, as well as knowledge, skills, and confidence to explain and implement Green Shores practices, as well as providing access to funding and expertise on where and when to apply Green Shores. By doing this, we increase the integration of Green Shores concepts and requirements into existing policy and planning instruments, as well as university curricula, as well increase trust and collaboration across disciplines. Now this, institutional 
enabling institutional environment and enhanced capacity to support adoption of green shores, as well as active green shores champions, increases the uptake of green shores. And this is a virtuous cycle that then leads to um, the impacts that we want to see on the ground that are depicted on the right hand side of the slide. We can come back to this kind of hypothesis or impact hypothesis of uh, the value of green shores and how it works through uh, the various um, uh, nodes in the results chain. So how can further um, uptake of green shores and BC be supported? Uh, we offered in our report uh, the following four recommendations. Um, and DG didn't uh, cross them all off, so they they must, must be so, somewhat relevant. Uh, first, align actors, resources, and incentives. The adoption of green shores techniques is voluntary at present, yet the original intent was to link certification to an incentive, uh, financial or non-financial, like financial like a grant, or non-financial like a fee deferral, um, or accelerated development permit. Unless alignment among resources, responsibilities, and incentives is improved, Wealthy homeowners, or we, we fear that wealthy homeowners, large property develop, developers, and large better resource communities may be the only ones able to implement green shores, green shores over time. Um, <clears throat> second, link green shores to other initiatives promoting nature-based solutions. Uh, initiatives and the community of practitioners promoting the adoption of nature-based nature approaches and meeting development challenges is growing in Canada. Uh, one example is uh, the Munici Municipal Natural Assets Initiative that many of you might have heard of. Rather than competing for attention and dollars, uh, we feel it's important to strengthen synergies and collaboration across the, the multitude of initiatives that are underway, when that makes sense. Third, tailor education and outreach to address barriers. Our research sheds light on outreach objectives that hold potential for eliminating barriers and taking advantage of opportunities. For example, stakeholders in, stakeholder interviews and focus groups reveal the importance of mobilizing contractors as change agents, as I mentioned before, and raising awareness of the full range of benefits provided by Green Shores projects among provincial actors in particular. So targeted campaigns focusing on these two audiences uh, would be beneficial. And fourth, enhanced learning and effectiveness monitoring. The relatively small number of Green Shores applications limits the um, Stewardship Center for BC's ability to make a compelling case for widespread adoption. There are 22 that, um, that DG listed off at the beginning, but there's still a small number. Um, at the same time, the few and largely opportunistic pilot sites implemented um, are not really enough to give a good idea of which approaches to use where and when. So the learning loop, we feel, is not yet complete. So our recommendation is for the Stewardship Center to select archetypal sites for implementation to maximize learning about the effectiveness of Green Shores approaches while enhancing monitoring requirements for the selected projects so that the performance of these projects can be assessed over time. And also, we can't stress this um, enough, is the importance of good monitoring data to be able to say something about the effectiveness of green shores to meet certain management objectives over time. Now, switching gears from the West Coast to the East Coast, um, workshop discussions highlighted that Atlantic stakeholders are enthusiastic about the prospect of extending aspects of green shores to the region. And indeed, coastal development challenges provide a degree of urgency in seeking sustainable solutions for shorelines that do not rely on engineered structure, structures alone. At least four reasons, there are at least four reasons to pursue opportunities to scale green shores to the Atlantic region at present. And these are the four summarized on this slide. First, um, conventional approaches to coastline, coastal protection using hard structures are proving insufficient in some locales and will likely become increasingly so as the climate changes. Instead of controlling nature, awareness of the need to work with nature is increasing, as is the recognition of the co-benefits that soft shoreline approaches bring in comparison to hard infrastructure. Second, soft shorelines can address habitat degradation and protection from erosion and storm surge flooding, and these are issues of concern for Atlantic Canadians today. Third, Feedback from workshop participants indicates a degree of political will present at the provincial level 
and an expanding community of practice. That means attitudes and norms regarding natural infrastructure, in this case, you know, green, shore, green, green shores practices, are shifting. For example, local nonprofits are actively providing resources and field support to help waterfront property owners naturalize their own stretch of coastline, particularly in Nova Scotia. And there are many examples. Finally, the region can capitalize on federal funding available and attention on advancing nature-based solutions to climate change adaptation. And I think there are also a number of federal um, representatives on the call today, yeah, so maybe they can talk about funding opportunities available as well. The next two slides show some high-level results from the online survey targeted at waterfront property owners and shoreline professionals in Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and PEI. If you're interested in drilling down further, um, this is a very, very, very quick um, skim of things. I, so I invite you to look at our project report, which is available on the SCBC website. From responses to the survey by waterfront property owners, we can glean that uh, green shores can help alleviate shoreline development issues waterfront property owners are concerned about. So that's good. Uh, we also gleaned that the levels of awareness of the range of soft shoreline techniques available is relative, are relatively low. So awareness is low of what exactly these techniques comprise. Although there is good fam familiarity with the two techniques noted on this slide. Therefore, outreach and education will be quite important. Also, awareness of programs promoting soft shoreline techniques is low, which could be an opportunity since, since green shores would not be entering a crowded space in terms of getting attention or visibility from other, um, other organizations or programs or services that promote soft shoreline techniques. Apologies, this slide is a little bit busier. Um, I did want to include everything in one, on one slide. As you can see, we received fewer completed surveys from shoreline professionals, but the ones that we did receive came from a range of uh, individuals, contractors, environmental consultants, staff from local governments and NGOs, who are working with homeowners and public sector organizations on a number of stewardship issues and coastal development issues. Uh, the coastal development issues this group is concerned about overlaps overlap with waterfront property owners, except that for shoreline professionals, seasonal storm surge flooding is also a major, major concern in pollution, less so compared to homeowners. Not surprisingly, this group is more familiar with the range of soft shoreline techniques we asked about, and um, I can let you know what those things were. Oh, that's not the right slide. Okay, I'm still on this slide. Um, sorry about that. When we asked about, oh, sorry, in, in just referring to the, the second bullet from the end there, when we asked about um, their views on the greatest potential for uptake of Green Shores practices, um, they responded that they view waterfront property homes with no pre-existing hard shoreline structures as well as shore protection in parks and recreational areas, as well as private residential developments as cases or types of environments with most potential for green shores uptake. And that, that makes a lot of sense. And then when we asked about the type of organization that would be most suitable to deliver soft shoreline programming like that delivered by the Stewardship Center for BC, the majority identified um, non-governmental organizations as a type of organization that would be uh, most suitable. So, our scoping research obviously was not a full market study or a comprehensive needs assessment, but based on the information gathered and what we learned about Green Shores in BC and how it was performing, we recommended that the rollout of Green Shores to the Atlantic region occur via the four steps on this slide as a five-year roadmap. So these four steps to be implemented over the next five years. Uh, ground truthing, a region-specific theory of change, is a first step to guide the efforts of the other th three steps so that the rollout has a reasonable chance of generating benefits to people and nature in the region in a cost-effective way. And I will show you in a little, uh, in a few seconds here, what I mean by a theory of change. Second, in rolling out Green Shores programming in the Atlantic region, 
um, the Stewardship Centers for BC is likely to retain some key roles, at least initially, in oversight, research and development, marketing support, as well as certification and registry. However, a prerequisite for tailoring green shores to the needs of maritime provinces is exploring options for day-to-day -day and local delivery in the near term. And so the second recommendation or step is really to identify and work for the SCBC to identify and work with a backbone organization. Um, such as the metaphor suggests, a backbone, organi backbone organization coordinates and drives multi-sectoral collaboration towards a common purpose. And this common purpose would be um, you know, advancing green shores, the capacity, interest, um, and, uh, and you know, changes in, in adopting green shores practices in, in the Maritimes. Uh, third, widespread adoption of soft shoreline techniques in Atlantic Canada won't happen overnight. Demand has to be created, capacities and motivation for delivery of technical services related to green shores built. In the near term, the most promising enabling tools range from awareness raising and education campaigns, as well as mobilizing financial resources to develop pilot sites. Those are the things that are important in the, in the near term. In the medium term, efforts can then focus on training for professionals and understanding regulatory barriers. And once those enabling conditions are in place and a case for regional and local action has been built, growing the depth and breadth of impact will require additional enabling tools, including a supportive regulatory environment, sustainable financial models, and perhaps even a regionally based certification scheme. Uh, the fourth step in the pill in in this sort of roadmap for scale out um, to the region is around communication and stakeholder engagement. Uh, any social change process, communication and stakeholder engagement are critical for any social stage change process or where a new or or um, practice is being uh, is being promoted. And in this case, waterfront property owners, shoreline professionals, communities regulators, and funders are among the groups with a stake in seeing Green Shore succeed in Atlantic Canada. And, but these groups, obviously, are not homogeneous. They include visionaries, uh, innovators, or those who are really willing to take risks, as much as pragmatists, and those who are gung-ho but really need some evidence that things work well. And these will have different needs and will want different things in terms of communications, engagement, the t and the, the guidance and tools to support their action. So communications and engagement strategies and tactics in the near term should ideally account for baseline differences in knowledge, attitudes, and behavior within and across these groups to be the most cost effective. Uh, finally, I just, and I'm really running out of time here, but I just wanted to leave you with this final slide, which is a draft conceptual model we developed outlining our hypothesis about the impact Green Shores programming in the Atlantic region could create over time and the pathways to get there. So the impact here is really at the, um, at the right end of this chain. And it's very small font, but hopefully you can enlarge it on your screen. But it really is about those kind of uh, delivery of those ecosystem benefits that um, that DG talked about at the beginning, the principles really driving adoption of, of green shores, as well as um, some economic impacts like municipal and provincial cost savings, uh, some social socioeconomic impacts, increased employment in the green economy, clean growth sector. So I invite you when you have a moment to take a more detailed look at the theory of change and any feedback you have on it uh, would be welcome. And now I'll just turn it over to DG for final remarks. Thanks. Thanks very much, Jimena. So just, um, you know, given what we've learned over uh, the past, uh, I guess, couple of years, and now that we have the final report, which as Jimena mentioned, is on our website, um, what, are, what are we going to do with this? So the first step is to be work with our Atlantic partners uh, and, and we've decided to focus uh, initially on Nova Scotia and hopefully scale out from beyond that. Um, in terms of, especially in terms of uh, training, we've established a memorandum of understanding with uh, St. Mary's University in Halifax, and we'd like to start working on developing some pilot projects there um, as per the scaling out. 
Um, we will be undertaking the update for the Green Tours for Homes, so that it'll be applicable to both uh, the Pacific and the Maritimes. Uh, and that will include some piloting the Green Tours for Homes credits in communities, both on lake environments as well as the uh, marine coasts. And then certainly looking to have some continuous improvement uh, of what we offer in British Columbia, uh, as well as mentoring uh, Nova Scotia uh, partners, and we'd like to establish a, a Nova Scotia local government uh, working group. So um, I realize that we're a little bit uh, over over time. So I think at this point we will turn it over to uh, John uh, to um, uh, the Q and A, and I'll leave you with uh, our contact information. And certainly would like to especially thank Natural Resources Canada for the uh, the majority of the funding for this uh, for this study. And our other funders there are uh, also acknowledged, and thank you for that. So I'll turn it to John now. Firm. For site level evaluations available online. And is there a link, or can resources be shared of the detailed Atlantic survey responses? So um, I guess I can start off and uh Richard you can uh, jump in so in terms of the uh right now the tool is uh, was developed for British Columbia and uh what we are going to be exploring is uh whether or not we can use uh, adapt it so that it can be used in in other other situations so right now it's British Columbia based, but um, we certainly, I think there would be value in uh, applying it elsewhere. And Richard, are you able to jump in on and I'll how that might work? Please hold while I confirm your passcode. Thank you for joining Global Meet, provided by Momentum Conferencing. When you hear the tone, you will be the sixth person to join the meeting. Hi, Richard, can you hear now? Yes. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Yep. Maybe we can go on to a question we received earlier here, DG. There, um, there's a question about whether there are any benefits of aligning Green Shores programming um, and projects with uh, procurement processes. Right. Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, John. We we um, we would like to see more uh, more of that, and I think as we have uh, rolled out. The, the various levels of the Green Shores training and the most recently with what we call the Green Shores Level 3. So we, we will have a registry of Green Shores approved professionals. And that the, the meaning of that is that professionals can apply the Green Shores credit and rating systems within their own uh, area of expertise. And what we can see that that procurement uh, process if they can refer to uh, desiring uh, professionals to be uh, Green Shores Level 3 or approved professional, then that will help drive more projects. So I think having, uh, we're just finishing the pilot for the Green Shores Level 3, and um, that will be offered as an online uh, course through uh, British Columbia Institute of Technology, so it can be applied right across uh, Canada. And um, it's a self-paced uh, self -paced course. And uh, I think that will help move from uh, 
help drive more projects as as uh, certainly at the government level they can request that their contractors and consultants uh, are uh, qualified to apply green tours in in those specific projects and I do know of uh, two cases where this has happened uh, here in BC the city of Surrey and their recent uh, call for um, uh, I think it was an RFQ and uh, and also the uh, district of Kitimat up the coast uh, looking at a park project so I think that can happen um, uh, more and more as as uh, we get more folks uh, Registered Thanks, DG, and we have a, a question for Richard here um, from Kristen, and maybe if Richard's audio is not working, um, you or Hamana can answer. Um, as Richard said, benefit transfer requires that values obtained in one place be modified to reflect the social economics of the site where the value will be applied. The Excel tool is designed to be applicable to other Green Shores projects, including Atlantic Canada. Is there a function within the tool to collect local economic information that allows values from BC to be applied in the Atlantic? Yeah, that's okay. Hey. Uh, I'm not sure if you can you hear me. Hello. Oh, right. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um. Uh. I mean, the, the, there, there's no um, need to transfer values um, uh, or make adjustments for income or um, other socioeconomic factors within Canada. And um, you typically would just um, use the same values in BC and apply them um, within uh, Eastern Canada. The only the only thing within the tool that would need to be modified would be the um, input output multipliers that um, uh, are at the moment BC specific. Um, they would need to be um, uh, uh, replaced with Nova Scotia or, you know, Newfoundland specific um, uh, multipliers. But we just the the, the adjustments are from um, like relative income levels um, and and uh, purchasing power parity between like the United and States and Canada, right over but time not here, within but Canada. I did have a quick question about shoreline professionals and. Um, you talked a lot about benefits, but were there were there any analysis on benefits directly for shoreline professionals, whether that's boosting their own their own business or promoting um, their work? Helena, do you want to take a stab at that? Sure, I can answer that quickly. And um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that we weren't able to show, but. Um, uh, part of uh, one thing, one output of the of the work in BC was the development of a similar sort of theory of change or impact model that uh, that we did for the Atlantic, um, and there certainly benefits to um, shoreline professionals contractors uh, c come in 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 as part of the results by way of um, <clears throat> increased skills and expertise uh, as well as um, kind of building a kind of a differentiator in in the competitive market space so we although we didn't um, we didn't quantify that in the the, the research that I did uh, it does come out as a benefit um, sort of re qualitatively when talking to stakeholders great thanks Amanda and a big thank you again to DG and Richard as well that was a, a great presentation and we enjoyed um, your thoughtful comments and analysis, and I'll remind folks that the presentation was shared today along with um, information on how to contact today's presenters. Um, so thanks everyone and thanks to our presenters and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye everyone.